questions and answers, if that's okay. Perfect. So you may you may begin and thank you so much again for giving us your precious time. We always love seeing you and hearing from you. Same here. Thank you. It's a it's a great honor. And so first I have to say that I don't know who is watching me. I just put my phone somewhere. So I only see myself and Rabbi Shiner right now. So whoever joined, welcome. And maybe afterwards I'll be able to see your faces and maybe say a personal hello to whoever I recognize. But uh, <laughs> Let me just say that uh, I would like first to dedicate this uh, class, this short talk to, to the well-being and the good health of uh, a dear member of your community, uh, Avram Ben Mazal. He should be very healthy always, and we should only hear good news from him and from the rest of the community as well. Amen. Amen. So uh, let me just share, share a few words. Um, where do I start? You know, it's like, it seems like we, we were quarantined here more or less around the time of Purim. And there was even a Purim party that I was invited to. And I, last minute, the person told me, listen, you can't come because my daughter just came from Milan and she's uh, quarantined in, at home. So, you know, what party is canceled. So it was like a bit more than a month ago in Purim. In the scroll of Esther, there's a famous verse where it says in Hebrew, Vayamima ele nizkarim v'nasim. Those days are uh, commemorated and realized, the day of Purim. We read about it in the Megillah, in the scroll of Esther. We celebrate it. It's commemorated. It's realized. A famous commentary from, comment from the Holy Ari, Rabbi Isaac Luria, the greatest Kabbalist of the 6th century. He's saying, regarding this verse in the scroll of Esther, he says, when those days are properly commemorated, commemorated, then they're being realized. It's like the same divine energy of miracles, the same radiance, the same situation is like repeating itself when we live up, when we relive those days, not just like stories that happened in the past in history, but something that's actually happening now, we properly remember them, then they're being realized. The same thing I want to share regarding now, and it's to do with Shvi Shul Pesach, the seventh day of Passover. As we know, you know, there was the famous exodus on the 15th of the month of Nisan, and that's the famous Passover, the Seder night, which we all celebrated already last week. But it's seven days of the holiday, and the seven days of the holiday actually finish Wednesday, for you guys overseas, it's a Thursday, it's two days, and it's the holiday that we call Shvi'i Shul Pesach, the seventh day of Passover. What happened then? Well, it's a process. The Exodus actually was a process. The seventh day was the splitting of the Sea of Reed, the Reed Sea, which people sometimes call the Red Sea, in maps name. So what happened? We reached the Sea of Reeds, and it was like a... A stumbling block, a block in front of us. We couldn't move forward. And yet, in the back, it was the army of Paro, the strongest army in the world. Pharaoh himself with all his army was chasing us. And here they are. Where do we go? What do we do? Do we go back? <laughs> do we move forward? Do we go to the sides? There's no place to go. What do we do? So the Midrash, the famous Midrash, it's called Mechilta from 2,000 years ago. The Mechilta is telling us that there were, it's all based on verses in the in scripture. You can all see it in the book of Exodus. It tells us that from the fear, there were actually four groups of people, of forefathers divided in four groups of people. Each one had a different solution for the situation. One was saying, let's throw ourselves into, into the water, into the sea. There were so depressed and so in despair and so there was like no solution. Let's just fall in the water. That's it. There's nothing to do. Another group said, let's go back to Egypt. There's no solution really. Let's go back. It's better in slavery, better in the old system, better with all the corruption and the suffering because <laughs> there's nothing else to do. A third party was saying, let's go fight the Egyptians. Well, <laughs> who knows? Maybe we have a chance, maybe we stand a chance, it's, 
they're stronger than us, but who knows? Let's try. Strategy, this, that, let's fight them. The fourth group said, you know what? We don't really think there's any solution. There's nothing we can do. Let's pray to God. It's all in scripture. And in the Midrash, the Midrash tells us in Lamb. And then Moses said, what was his solution? Move forward. And we all know the miracle. We all know what happened. There was one brave man, the first one. He's called Nachshon, pioneer Nachshon ben Aminadab. Went into the water. The sea split. And the rest is, uh, is history. <laughs> it's something that we all know. Uh, the sea split was an amazing miracle. We all crossed the Sea of Reeds. And eventually the desert, Mount Sinai, after 40 years, here in the land of Israel. The situation right now is very similar. Some people, you know, are experiencing the, the, the challenge, the virus, the situation that the world maybe has never experienced before. Maybe yes, I don't know. We can't measure, but definitely something on a global level, in real time, it's something, yes, we all, world is experiencing it together at the same time through media and everything. We all know more or less what's happening in the world. And some people fall in depression. Some people see no solution. You say, that's it. No more world, God forbid. I mean, <laughs> that's it. It's, it's gone. Life is no good. God forbid I'm depressed. God forbid I'm giving up. God forbid there's nothing I can do. It's too big, too great. God is punishing us. All these ideas. I mean, I don't know where people get it from. Second, some people say, oh, you know what? It's true that the old system, you know what, is not so good, really. The stress, the, 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 we're all so nervous and so not relaxed and things are corrupted and things are not functioning so well in society, in politics, in economy, in, in, in whatever, in health even, you know, all kinds of issues. You know what, if it's better, you know what, let's go back to the old way. That would be even better, you know, like, why? Why? Maybe it's an opportunity to make things better. Some people say, and you see it right and left, let's fight the system. You know, it's corrupted, it's no good, all these errors, it's his fault, it's their fault, it's a 5G, it's a Chinese people, it's Obama, it's, I, I, whatever it is, it's the health ministry, it's, it's media, whatever, there's someone to blame, let's fight them. It's like fighting the Egyptians, you know, fighting the system, the old system. Some people say, you know, there's nothing you can do, let's pray. We can't go to the synagogue, you know what we pray for? You know, sometimes we're lucky we go to the, like in Israel, no, it's, it's so beautiful to see these things, you know, like how oh, people pray together in the balconies, in the backyards, and creating a minion, you know, out of nowhere, out of nothing, you know, it's like happening, like we're all together. But at the end of the day, you know, it's really like, it's really like those days, when was it? 3,332 years ago, on this eve of the Sabbath of Passover, it was exactly the same situation. But what do we do? I think what we must do, of course, is move forward. That's what God wants from us. Of course, he wants us to pray. He wants us to think good and be good and do good and be positive and optimistic. And there's no question about it in the holiday. And you know what? Be happy, for sure. You know, the Samachta Bechagecha, you should rejoice and be happy. It's a mitzvah, it's a commandment, which is very accurate also. But it's time really to bring the best out of ourselves. It's an opportunity. You know what? In many ways, you know what, when we say freedom, and this is Passover, right? Liberation, you know what? Coming out of oppression, of, of, of systems, of whatever, that were not good. You know what, in, in many ways, a third word you can add to freedom, liberation, you know what, is the word called reset. You know, reset, yes. Sometimes, you know, our sages are so smart to say the Talmud, you know, that the captive cannot imprison himself. himself. He cannot release himself. He cannot, you know, get himself out of, of prison. A captive is inside. He needs someone else to come and open the door for him, the chains and, and, and the, the, the gate, and, and give him a piece of paper so he can be a free man. You know, he, he can't do it himself. So in many ways, God is giving us an, an opportunity now, you know what, to, to make things better. There's no stress at home. You relax. You can change things, change things, and really and truly, bring the best out of ourselves. And, and the truth is, this is what I see right and left here with people. But for that, just like Moses and the Israelites and our forefathers in the desert then with Pharaoh and, and right before 
crossing the Sea of Reeds, it was a matter of changing, you know, your mindset. It was about not seeing the, the sea anymore as a stumbling block, but rather as a challenge. And, and Moses was the one to say, just move forward, have trust in God, and you'll see that God, the miracles of God will do for you. Just move forward. And, and, and when we think of our, for ourselves, you know what, very much we're like those Israelites, our forefathers back then, because they saw miracles in Egypt. They saw the 10 plagues. They saw the Exodus. They were starting the journey, you know, towards Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. Later on to the land of Israel, the land of milk and honey, finally. So all of a sudden, you know, it's a challenge. Life is about challenges. You know, afterwards, it was also the war of Amalek. There were other things. There's ups and downs and ins and outs. But I want to tell you another thing. Here I am in Tzad from the city of Kabbalah. You know, I mentioned that life is ups and downs and hills and valleys, you know. <laughs> That's a beautiful land of Israel. You know, looking from my window here, you see the, the hills of the Upper Galilee and the Lower Galilee and Mount Orbel and Mount Novo and Mount Meron and the Golan Heights, right here from my balcony. And I also do see the valleys, you know. <laughs> It's called Emek Dinosaur, the Valley of Dinosaur, and the Sea of Galilee. You know, it's hills and valleys, ups and downs in life. That's, that's very normal. But there's another scale. There's another scale in life, which is inwardness and outwardness. You bring in, you take in, you know what? And you bring out. And here in Tzvah, the history, the, 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 the city of, of Kabbalah, we have this experience and we see those perspectives, you know, quite often. Imagine, and you know the famous story about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar, classical text of Kabbalah from the second century. Before he wrote down the book, almost 2,000 years ago, part of the oral Torah. Well, it was in a famous story. He was in a cave. He was quarantined. He was, you know, hiding from the Romans for 13 years here in the Western Galilee, in the village of Pekin, the ancient village of Pekin. And then he came out in big light and big, great revelation. Here in Tzfat, 16th century, it was the Holy Ari, Rabbi Isaac Luria revealed the new paradigm of Kabbalah, sharing the light and wisdom of Jewish spirituality like never before. Where was he before coming to Tzfat? Well, he was sort of quarantined, right, in a small hut by the river Nile in Egypt for seven years, just learning by himself. Nobody knew, nobody saw him. Even his wife saw him only like once a month. You know, so for seven years, <laughs> nobody saw the Holy Ari, and then he fully revealed himself and his wisdom here in Tzfat. The Baal Shem Tov, Rabbi Yisrael, who, who introduced a new paradigm of Kabbalah, Jewish spirituality, Hasidic philosophy, the same thing. He was hiding in the forests, meditating, learning with a small group, elite group of, of scholars, of Kabbalists, of the hidden Dikim, as they were called, the righteous people. And then one day, oh, a revelation of big light. So it's the same thing now. I'm sure that God is preparing something very good for us, a much better world, opportunities there. And you know what? Think about it. You know, we believe in divine providence. God is definitely with us. He always has been with us. More revealed, more concealed. <laughs> miracles, more miracles, less miracles. He's here and he's watching over us and he's giving us the strength, especially now on the eve of Passover, the seventh day of Passover, to bring the best of, our, of ourselves to move forward. I tell you, <laughs> I don't know, you know exactly the, the times where we are now we're with. 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, I'll just share, uh, I don't know, you know, an opportunity, a story. I'm here at home already for more than four weeks, maybe five weeks. I do go to the center. I mean, I know I've seen a few faces, so I know some of you have been to our center, a beautiful center in Tzfat, in the old city of Tzfat, the visitor center, Tzfat Kabbalah Center. I do go there once a week, I have to admit. No curfew, yes curfew. I, you know, get to get the inspiration, and of course, I. Hopefully I use it in a good way. So, but I'm home and four of my kids are home. I have more kids and not all of them are home. Some are big and they left home already. <laughs> some live in kibbutz here and some in kibbutz in another place like in the area of Tzfat and some, in, and, and I have a daughter in, in Jerusalem right now. They're not all home, but my little kids are home. So I started learning, uh, I started teaching my, my younger boy, Shmuel, he's uh, almost 10. I started teaching him uh, chess, how to play chess, you know. We have a chess board at home and we started playing together. And I, so he asked me, Daddy, did you used to play 
chess at the, in, in school when you were my age? I told him yes. And how were you like in your class, like among, you know, were you better than other students, other, <laughs> other friends of yours? I told him I was always second. Yes, I was second best in my class uh, playing chess. Was, there was no way I would be able to be number one. I said, why not? So I because number one was a guy that was really, really a child in, in my class. He was really a genius. You know what? He was so beyond. There was no way that I could win, you know, playing chess with him. And then I started thinking of this boy that was in my class. And he was really a genius. Uh, apparently, I mean, early in high school, you know, he, him and his parents moved to the States. So we actually only learned with him for a few years in the same class. And he finished high school at 15, you know, as that genius. And I started looking him, looking up online, you know, I started asking, you know, where, where do I find him? Maybe I'll reconnect with him just because, you know, it's an opportunity, we have time. So I discovered he, he actually went to Harvard and he was a professor for mathematics in, in Harvard. The youngest ever to become a professor in Harvard is he got it when he was 26 years old, professor for mathematics. Very sweet guy. So I, found him on Facebook, we started connecting, and God willing, we'll keep in touch. I mean, I'm just sharing this as a, you know, a story from, from, from real life now. You know, it brings opportunity to reconnect with people you haven't spoken to in a long time. You play chess with your kids, you know, you know it's like you can do so many things, and God bless, you know, here, I personally and, and staff of our center work, of course, the center is closed, as I mentioned, but we work a lot online, you know, webinars. There was one day last week, right before the holiday, where I taught, five classes, three webinars a day, and my wife teaches, and my colleagues teach. Baruch Hashem, you know, there's so much we can do. We work, again, on, on, on developing, a, you know, for the, the morning after, you know, the, the new visitor center with the media for, for high tech and spirituality that we're working on, and the, the open classes that we do, and, and there's so much, that, there's so much to do. There's always a lot to do, you know, and creativity. Guys, let's, let's admit it, you know, I'm sure, you know, people use social media, and you see all these I don't know, <laughs> cartoons and little videos people share and everything. I mean, this humor, I mean, where was this all this time? It brings the best humor, you know, the situation of the people, you know. So many great things happen, you know, in a personal level, in a community level, in a spiritual level. One other Dvar Torah, one short thing. It's a force, it's a Pesach thing. And in Passover, we all know the famous song, Dayenu, right? Dai, Dayenu, Dai, Dayenu, Dai, Dayenu, Dayenu, Dayenu. What is this song about? I mean, it's, we thank God, right, for 15 miracles that he has performed for us, you know, upon the Exodus, and then he actually brought us to the land of Israel, and we built a holy temple, we built by King Solomon. Anyway, so we're thanking God for all the miracles in he has done for us, and for the fact he's always with us since Abraham, all the way up until this very day. And that this is, you know, we, we sing the Yenu. So one of the lines of the Yenu is also to do with the seventh of the day of Passover, the holiday we're going to be celebrating tomorrow night. And what which line is that? We're saying another miracle that shows how God was showing his loving kindness to us so beautifully is the fact that he didn't just split the sea. Right? But we're saying, meaning we're thanking God for not just opening the sea, but for enabling us to walk on a dry land. Because we would, would have walked on the mat. You know, if it's mud, if it's a muddy land, you know what? It, maybe it's not so convenient. I always ask myself, you know, what's the. What's the big deal with that, you know, with, uh, one second. Let me just fix my, my Zoom here. Okay. I always ask myself, you know, what, what, what's the big deal? Why is it such a, such a great thing, you know, to, <laughs> to enable us to walk in a dry land? Personally, you know, some of you know me, I grew up in Tel Aviv. And grew up in Tel Aviv, you know, I actually grew up five minutes walk from the beach. So very often, of course, I would go to the beach, a beautiful beach of Tel Aviv. And, you know, jogging on the beach, you know, you know, it's like so much more comfortable, you know, when a little bit of humidity, you know, under your feet, it's so pleasant and so comfortable. Why then are we thanking God 
for walking us in the sea, but in a very dry land. You know, the, the, the below, underneath our feet, it was very dry, not muddy, not wet, not humid. Well, what's the story? So here I came across a very beautiful explanation in Hasidic philosophy, which says the following. It's really beautiful. It says, what is the meaning of sea, of an ocean, of water, comparing to, to land? You know, our sages say in the Talmud, everything you find in the land, you also find in the, underneath the water in the sea. It's the same, you know, there's so many creatures which are alike, even have the same names, more or less in Hebrew and so on and so forth. It's really the same thing. But what's the difference between land and ocean or water covering, you know? that here it's revealed, and in the water it's concealed, it's underneath the water, you just don't see. It. So water covering the earth, this water is like the concealed, it symbolizes the concealed spiritual worlds that, that we don't see. Everything, all the upper world's constellation, all that is that the eye cannot see. And the land is, what we call the revealed world. It's this world, what we see, what we sort of understand, or we think we see, or we think we understand. So that, that the water was completely dry, the, the land was completely dry, like not even a trace of water, not even a drop of water, it was fully dry. It symbolized the fact that all the upper worlds, everything was so revealed to us, and it says that the little kids were pointing out to the heavens and say, wow, this is the, the divine chariot we, we, we heard about. This is God. And it says that a simple man, a simple woman, you know. So while crossing the sea, what the greatest of all prophets, you know, wasn't able to see. It was such a lofty revelation. So it's time, therefore, the seventh day of Passover, it's time of revelation, it's time of hope, it's time of trust, it's time of happiness, it's time of looking into ourselves and bringing the best of ourselves, that in us, in us which is still concealed, bring it out and make it revealed, you know, improve your relationships and, and, and all your good intentions and all your good thoughts and all your good ideas, you know what, reveal it, share it, openly let other people enjoy it as well I'll, sh I'll end with a with a story that i just saw in the media today in fact here in israel you know that uh, um very soon when is it in two weeks from now maybe two and a half weeks we will celebrate yom atzmaut day of independence a great miracle that happened here as well the independence of the state of israel 72 years ago. So I read that one of the, one of the people that we light, you know, we always light this uh, big, uh, this big torch, or what do you call it, the Masu'a, the big fire, you know, symbolic, like 12 people light big fires, like the 12 tribes of Israel. It's part of the um, famous uh, ceremony, the official ceremony uh, hosted by the, by, the, by the government, the Israeli government. So I read that one of the, of the people that we like, the, the fire of Yom Atzmaut, of the Independence Day celebration, is actually a lady that I know. She lives in Nepal. I mean, she's Israeli. She's a young Israeli woman. That's for 20 years now, she and her husband, who's also Israeli, they run a Chabad house, you know, in Nepal. And <laughs> it's famous. It became famous over the years, I think maybe two years ago or three years ago. We also in media here in Israel, how the set of of the Passover set there in Nepal is actually the largest in the world. I think they had like 4,000 people. Can you imagine 4,000 people together? No social uh, distancing, you know, they're all together in one room, in one place. 4,000 people, Jews and Israelis, you know, all celebrating Passover together. So, so this lady was chosen by the Israeli government to be one of the uh, people to light the, to light the fire in Yom Atzmaut celebration, which I think it's amazing. And uh, they help also in all the disasters and sometimes, you know, People get lost in Nepal, they always find them with helicopters and everything. These people are great, great work there. But that reminded me of a story which I'll share with you. 
which I heard actually not long ago from a friend of mine who lives in Tzfat. His name is Asi Spiegel, and uh, he already has been to Nepal 30 years ago, and he did the first public seder in Nepal. I mean, this is quite amazing. You know, nowadays you have Chabad houses everywhere, but those days there was no such thing. Uh, public seder or other in the world. And uh, Rabbi Asi, my friend, he, he was the first one. He was like a 20 something years old. And he went with a friend of his, a Canadian guy. And the two of them just went to Nepal. And uh, they were sent from New York. They sent them a uh, matzot and, uh, and wine and, and meat and, and all kinds of uh, other things and ingredients that they needed. And they thought they'll have like for 100 people, 200 people. Eventually, they were arranging and planning for 200 people to join the seder. Actually, now I remember that I actually saw a movie about it in, in a movie theater in Israel like uh, some 20 years ago or something. Anyways, about this uh, journey of theirs. Anyway, so they were there. They were in the Israeli uh, what was it, embassy or consulate, or probably an embassy in Kathmandu. And that's in the courtyard there. That this is the place that they, they were given by the ambassador and, you know, to start preparing for the, for the Passover. And, so who will cook? They will cook. Who will cut the vegetables? They cut the vegetables. Who will prepare? They'll prepare. Who builds a tent? They'll build a tent. There's no company to build it. Everything these two young boys did on their own. However, something happened, and it's really <laughs> like one of these stories, you know, like three days before the, the, the Pesach, the, 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 the Leila Seder, the Seder night they were preparing for, there was a, a rebellion, sort of a revolt. Something happened in, in, in Nepal against the king. So the king, the Nepalese king, he, he issued, he authorized a curfew. Not just quarantine, a curfew. Nobody goes out, nobody comes in, nobody moves in the street, nothing. To protect himself, to defend, to de to defend the, the, the monarchy. So uh, the, the ambassador and the people of the embassy told, told my friend and his, and his friend, they said, guys, we're sorry, but it seems like it's not going to happen. I mean... You prepared, you built, you, <laughs> you did everything, all the preparations, you sent the invitations and everything, that's great. But this is a situation, I mean, it's curfew. And now that they passed curfew, now that they passed curfew, I mean, what do you do? And it's one day before Seder, what do you do? So my friend told me, he, he really described the feeling, you know. He said, what do you do? It's a stumbling block, it can't be. When you, you prepare for such a, holy thing, <laughs> such a divine thing, such a good thing in the eyes of God. And you were sent by the Sadiq, the great Rebbe, you know, from, 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 from New York. Something must happen in a good way. He said that all the time he was hosting positive thoughts in his mind. And then, like, less than 24 hours before the Seder, the king said, Okay, democracy. <laughs> democracy. It's a miracle. A miracle. Let's continue. Invitations. It's happening. This and that. It can't be. It's happening. And it was. There was like around 200 people. It was a great event and everything. Three days later, the king announced, the Nepalese king announced, no democracy. Back curfew, back rebellion, back everything. So I'm saying, you know what? When you aim good and you want to do good and you think good, it will be good. So this is the time to know that God is with us and have no fear, friends. Just do good. Thank you, Rabbi Yael. Yael, thank you so much for your beautiful words. What was Pesach like in Svat? Okay, so you know what Svat looks like? <laughs> neighborhoods and neighborhoods and neighborhoods. I mean, I don't live in the old city. But uh, I tell you what, so it was really a time of Pesach, each family to itself. I know that uh, many were hoping that last minute maybe somebody will come, a family member from out of town will come. No, it was small stirring everywhere. But God bless, again, like in my neighborhood, like other neighborhoods, we were able to do tefillah, beautiful tefillah through the balconies and everything, and singing Hallel together. And that was, the, you know, the seder and the first day of the holiday and everything. Nowadays, Cholamoed, there was one day I went to the, to the center, to the old city. Uh, the alleyways are empty. I mean, really, you don't see in, in the in ancient spot. 
you don't see a, a single person. But some stores are open and you know you can do a little shopping and this and that. And I must tell you that whoever you meet in the street is extra nice. I don't know, you know, I don't know, maybe because we don't see that much people these days, you know. So whoever you do see, you know, it's like you you speak to a little bit, tell a joke, ask what's doing, you know, and, and conversations seem to be a little longer. Of course, we keep distance. Uh, also in Tzfat, uh, unfortunately, we have some people who are hospitalized. Nobody is in, in bad condition, God bless. Uh, nobody. Like, But we have like 50, I think 56 people uh, were hospitalized. Some were already released home. Um, people keep, you know, good, uh, good atmosphere. Just now, as we started the class, actually, as we started speaking now, I heard outside there was like a a truck with DJ, you know, and this has been happening today and yesterday, playing music for kids and for adults and people are dancing in the balconies and everything. The municipality is doing great. Uh, in Israel, and you see it also in Tzfat, you know, we see all these uh, media personas that uh, perform from home for free on Zoom or other applications that you can just watch it and enjoy. Uh, so I'm saying it's not the most joyful time, obviously. I mean, you know, we wish for, for better times and we're sure those much, much better times are coming. Uh, but we do the best of what, what we can and everybody seems to, to keep the same thing, you know, optimism, thinking good, doing good, caring for others. You see people reach out to people that they haven't spoken to in a long time. You hear stories like I just shared with my friend from Harvard, but same thing is happening with many people. People are good. I have to say people are good, keeping good, good vibe, good feeling, and are happy to share it. Tell me, uh, how many of your own children were at your Seder? Okay, so God bless, we have nine kids, and only four were home. It's my big daughter and the three little ones. And three, my three bigger boys were actually celebrating together, the three of them. One of them is in a pre-army program, and he was released, obviously. And my big boy, he lives in a kibbutz, kibbutz Machanaim, right near here, on the way to Ramat Golan, beautiful place. He has a place of his own. So three boys were there. They're doing the seder by themselves. <laughs> Just to make sure, uh, the day before the seder, we did like a Zoom learning together with the family. My sister from Tel Aviv, who usually joins us as well, uh, for the set of here, she had to stay there, so I instructed her also on Zoom. We did like a family Zoom together, explaining everyone what, what they need to do. And the two daughters of mine, one of them is actually also living in a kibbutz here on, which is right on the Lebanese border, not far from here, like 20 minutes drive far from here. We thought, till the last one, will she come? Will she not come? And then she stayed where, where she is, and the other daughter went with her, so five were out, four were in. Look, I can't, I, 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 I tell you what. Personally, and I speak from my heart really and truly, and I'm sure my wife, Natalie, she sees things the same way. I know they had great Seder because they all reported and, and they were so high and it's an opportunity for them to, to, to do something different, you know? So yes, I wish that we were all together, but that it were not together, but yet they, they brought the best out of themselves and they did it on their own and they were so happy with it. And they were singing all night, both the boys and the girls and, oh, Hashem, I'm happy, you know? And uh, I also think, you know, that uh, for those that, you know, feel a little, look, not everybody married to be, you know, with family. Some people are really just a couple, an old couple alone, or some type of person is by himself or whatever for the seder. And this also is a situation that did happen here in Israel. But sometimes I think, you know, if, even if you're not with, with your family, it makes you, makes you long for them and think more of them and, and realize how much you miss them and everything, how much you love them. Obviously, you know, the connections afterwards will be so much more meaningful and, and better, you know. Even in relationship in family, there's always room for, for, for more and for more care and for better connection. I think it's a time for, for all these things to, to happen, you know, establish good relationship with, with friends, with from near, from far. You know what, even sometimes just social media friends, you know what, get to know them better. There's, there's so much good in everybody. And I really see, you know, this good comes out. I have to say the truth. Have you heard any Kabbalistic secrets that maybe someone is saying 
what this is all about on a deeper spiritual level, what, what this could be connected to. I know we've heard different people saying Mashiach may be coming. Uh, what is your feelings or take on this? First of all, first of all, I tell you honestly, from, from in a very realistic, down-to-earth, maybe also Kabbalistic, spiritual, I don't want to call it mystical because, you know, Kabbalah nowadays is not so much mystical because it's all down-to-earth. Everybody can study and understand. But maybe also mystical, you know what? <laughs> Holistic, <laughs> every perspective, logical. Of course it's Mashiach. <laughs> There's no question that Mashiach is coming and with every passing day, of course, it makes make him come sooner than later. There's no question about it. And you know, what is Mashiach really? Mashiach, the, the days of Mashiach, the times of Mashiach, it's different. It's a different reality in the entire world, you know? It's in stages, by the way, but, but how? I mean, when was it ever in world history that the whole world, like now, have experienced a change, a shift? You know what, I even saw the, the Pope, you know, I don't know if you saw that, that video, you know, speaking of, of, of Shabbat, the Jewish people, they have Shabbat. A reminder that there is a soul. We're not just robots. We're not machines. We're human. We have a soul. I saw videos, you know, we have in, in Spot, we have this beautiful, it's been two years now, we have this beautiful Latin center. So it, well, I see videos, you know, from, from, from the Latin world in, in Spanish also. Uh, you know, leaders of, 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 of uh, countries in Latin America, in Central America, is uh, from Panama, so where do you see also from Guatemala, from, from, from Argentina, all speak about. It's a new time. God, please be with us and Mashiach and everything. Definitely, it's time that the world as one, we have to say the truth. We see it right and left. People are expecting something good to come out. So maybe this stage is now what we call Chevlei Mashiach. It's the, the last process, like Chevlei Mashiach, it's like, like a birth, you know. It's called the birth, you know process of that leads to Mashiach. Birth, you know, it's sometimes it's not so, you know, labor, you know, it's not so comfortable. Sometimes it's painting and sometimes it's like, what's going on? You know, it's like everything is shaking, but then the best is comes, comes out afterwards. So yes, it's time of, I strongly believe that Mashiach is behind the door <laughs> and it's coming uh, very soon. It's a matter of the consciousness, definitely. You now that the consciousness of, of humans are is, is open and it's a paradigm shift by any by everyone, you know, that awaiting something great and, and global to happen. Do we want to go back to the old order? Was it the order? It was chaotic, it was anarchy, I think, more than other things. But anyways, everybody wants like something good, you know. So God willing, yes, but since you mentioned the uh, Rabbi Shana, you mentioned Mashiach, let me just mention that uh, on Thursday, I mean Wednesday is a Sivishal Pesach. Thursday is uh, the last day of Passover, and there's a beautiful tradition coming from the Hasidic world, but it's celebrated everywhere. I mean, in Tzvat, at least I know every synagogue does it, and every community, and not just Tzvat, but everywhere in the world we hear about it. It's Sudat Mashiach, uh, the Feast of Mashiach. It's uh, to get every family, uh, community, whoever can, you know, gather. These days, no gathering, so every family to its own. Taking out uh, the matzahs, <laughs> that are left from, from Passover and drinking four cups of wine and matzah on Thursday afternoon. It's called Sudat Mashiach, the Feast of Mashiach instituted by the Baal Shem Tov. And, and when we, I tell you what, I personally, for the last uh, 14 years, I've been doing Sudat Mashiach here in Tzfat at the beautiful Kenan Spa Hotel. It's a luxurious five-star, you know, ultra deluxe hotel in Tzfat. And every year they have like uh, 200 uh, guests. So every year they invite me, or it's like a tradition. I go and I run the Sudat Mashiach, the Mashiach uh, feast, you know, the, the last day of Passover. It usually buys a special Pesach, seventh day of Passover for them. And the most beautiful to, thing to see is the people from all different backgrounds in Jewish world, religious, not religious, more religious, yes, whatever. These all kinds of people, men, women from overseas, Israelis, all <laughs> love, <laughs> you know, hearing and talking and, and, and everything about Mashiach. But the last thing we do always, it's a, also, also a tradition this year, it's not going to happen. I'm going to be home. No hotels, <laughs> no tourism industry in Israel these days. 
Uh, but the, the beautiful, most beautiful thing about it is that we, we dance, we do a Mashiach dance. So it's like the last day of Passover. What does it, what does it symbolize? Our trust and faith in God that is bring us the best of the best and that is with us and that is not going to abandon us. And as Jewish people, we have the, the merit to look back into the days of Pharaoh and slavery and hardships and ups and downs of our history. And who knows what people have been through, but, but without optimism, without joy of the holidays, you know, we wouldn't be here. And it's always, you know, yes, it's Mashiach. It's the consciousness of Mashiach that, that the ultimate good is to come. And uh, with that, we'll, with that in mind, we'll dance. I'll dance with my family. Uh, four cups of wine, matzot, and be happy with the rest of the world. Amen, amen. Um, thank you very, very much, Rabbi Iyal. Um, Myra, can you take everyone off mute? Maybe someone wants to speak directly with Rabbi Iyal. Rabbi Shalom, before, before, <laughs> Before personal, maybe, uh, I, don't, I don't, like I said, I don't see the people. I just want to say one, one comment. I was, uh, I was on my way to Palm Beach. I was going to come, you know, like in March. It didn't happen. And you see in June or July, guys, you come to me, right, Rabbi Shana? You come with a, a delegation, a mission, youth, adults, women group, whatever. So, God willing, we'll all dance and rejoice very soon in Tzfat, in Jerusalem, with all your congregation and your community. Bezrat Hashem, Amen, Amen. Amen. Rabbi Riz, I read in the paper today, I don't know if you heard this, that uh, they said they're not going to open flights to Israel till September. I heard this. I heard. Terrible. That means you can't go there this summer. Yeah, I know. I know, I know, for sure. I know, I know. It's going to take time. It's going to take time, and, and I know that, and... Look, even, I just want to remind everyone, you know, that uh, more than a decade ago, right, it was SARS, and then it was MERS, and then it was all those things. But remember, guys, these, these viruses just disappeared just one day, you know. There was a vaccine for, 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 for SARS, and they didn't just use it, and it just disappeared. The same thing was happening now. So for the world to go back, again, tourism, flights, isn't that, I know it will take time. But we're praying for you. Anyone like to ask Rabbi Reese a question directly? Hello, hello. It's hard to hear. Okay, well, Rabbi Reese, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. And Mordim Lassim Chayav, a good yantif. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Abraham Ben Mazel. Abraham all the best. Thanks, Samir. Thanks,